high their strikers. There's something uniquely disturbing about people vanishing into thin air. Read about these incredibly strange, unsolved cases although these disappearances span centuries, locations, age ranges, and circumstances, there's one common thread shared between them, a lack of closure. There are theories, speculations, and investigations, but never a decisive answer. On our incoming, episode I'm going to feature some of the cases of mysterious disappearances of some missing that just disappear without any trace. Disappearance of Michelle Ann Harris a Vestal High School graduate who later became a star attackman and four-year letterman for the Hobart College men's lacrosse NCAA Division III champion teams in the early 1980s, met Michelle Ann Taylor, who had earned an associate's degree from the State University of New York at Moraville. Later in the decade when she worked on the lot of one of the car, dealerships his family owned in Chioga County, on the southern tier of upstate New York, between Binghamton and Elmira and south of Ithaca. They married in 1990 and settled on a 252 acre, 102 hectares estate outside the village of Spencer in northern Cioga County, where Michelle had grown up she had the first of the couple's four children in 1994. In 1999 the marriage started to fail when Michelle discovered, while pregnant with their youngest child, that Cal had been having an affair with another clerk on one of the car lots. He justified this affair on the grounds she was not keeping the house clean enough. When she confronted him, he promised to end it but, she later learned, did not, rekindling it on a vacation trip to Barbados. After her son was born, in October 2000, she stopped, sharing a bed with her husband sleeping on the couch in the family's home. A month later, at a bar, she met Brian Early, a younger man visiting the area from Philadelphia, where he worked as a surveyor. Soon the two were having discreet meetings in the Poconos of nearby northeastern Pennsylvania. The two used phone cards when they called each other, so that the caller ID would display as a random jumble of numbers, in order to keep their relationship a secret from Carl Harris and the children at the beginning of 2001, Michelle filed for divorce. During the first half of the year, Cal repeatedly told Michelle he would not let her divorce him. Bob Thayer, the couple's nanny, recalls hearing frequent loud arguments. Cal tried to get Michelle's family to talk her out of the divorce, believing she had been influenced by the people she was increasingly associating with and might even be using drugs. Michelle told her sisters that at one point in March Cal told her during an argument that he would not need a gun to kill her and the police would never be able to find her body. She also let her hairdresser overhear Cal threaten to kill her and make her disappear over the phone in July. In June Cal was ordered to pay her $400 a month and continue to pay all the expenses related to the house, until the divorce was finalized. Cal was also ordered to give all his guns to his brothers and father until the divorce was over and Michelle had moved out. The court estimated his net worth at 5.4 million. He offered her full custody of the children and a settlement of $740,000 over the next 10 years, but she rejected it. Cal's payments to Michelle supplemented what she earned from a part-time waitressing job at Lefties, a restaurant in the nearby village of Waverley, 
she had started in April. Early left his girlfriend and moved to Shioga, another town in the area, that June, expecting that the two would marry soon after her divorce. While she was interested in a long-term relationship with him she told her friends she did not plan to marry him. He gave Michelle the keys to his house to let his dogs out if he was working late, and she left some belongings there, as some nights she would come there after work, as late as 2.30 a.m. Early was not Michelle's only love interest at this time. For two months she had a relationship with lefty's manager, Michael, Casper, that she had told no one else about. Another employee of the Harris family dealerships later admitted to having make-out sessions in the back seats of cars on the lot, and there was also a man from Texas about whom little was known that she was linked to. The tension in the Harris house abated by August. Cal had offered Michelle $80,000 annually in alimony and child support along with, custody of the children. Through her attorney, she filed for a court-ordered appraisal of his business, to be charged to him at a cost of $30,000. Trial was set for October 22nd. As summer ended, on the weekend after Labor Day, Thayer noted that Michelle seemed happier than she had in a while. Michelle confided in her that she had decided to accept Cal's offer but had not yet informed him. I'm finally getting my life back, Michelle told Thayer. I can't believe how I feel. She was scheduled to talk to her lawyer on September 12th that was not the only significant event Michelle had planned for the second week of September 2001. Over that coming weekend, she told Cal she was taking a trip to New York City to visit a college friend. She also informed some of her friends about the trip, but said her goal was to sell or pawn some of her jewelry, including her engagement ring, in order to make her half of the down payment on the home she and Early had agreed to buy in Oego, the county seat, near where the children went to school. She also reportedly had run up significant debt on her credit card and bounced checks when Thayer arrived at the Harris house on the afternoon of September 11 to babysit the children, Michelle was having a headache. Travel to New York had been severely restricted in the wake of the September 11 terrorist attacks that morning making it likely she would not be able to travel there the next weekend and sell her jewelry as planned. Since her work uniform of dark blue polo shirt and khaki shorts had not yet dried, she was late for the start of her shift, Michelle worked until 9 p.m. that night, when lefties closed. Afterwards, she stayed in the parking lot and discussed the day's events over drinks with Casper, the co-worker she had had the affair with earlier in the year, and a friend of his. After an hour, she left for Early's apartment in Smithboro, where she stayed for another hour, sharing drinks with him and discussing how the day's terrorist attacks had given her some perspective on her own problems. According to Early, she left sometime between 11 and 11.30. No one has reported seeing her since then. At 7 a.m. the next morning, Cal called Thea and told her Michelle had not come home after work last night. He asked if she could come to their house, a six-minute drive from her own, and help get the children ready for school. She, dressed quickly, cancelled an engagement for later that day, and left her house eight minutes later. On the road in front of the Harris's driveway, 
She saw Michelle's gold Ford Windstar minivan parked on the side. Thea parked briefly to take a look. The doors were unlocked and the keys still in the ignition. She drove down the Harris's driveway, which curves through fields and woods a quarter mile, 400 meters, to the house, making it impossible to see the road from it. In the house she called out Michelle's name, hoping she might have walked the from her car, but Cal responded, already dressed for work. Thea told him that Michelle's car was on the road. We better go get it, he said, and the two drove back down to inspect it further. Thea eyed the possibility that Michelle might still be, in the vicinity, perhaps injured or disoriented. Cal told her that she had gone to New York City as she had told him she was going to. When Thea asked how, since her car was on the road, Cal suggested she had perhaps hitchhiked. Cal took note of the many items in the vehicle, clothing, mail, magazines, toys and food wrappers primarily, and said he needed to get the vehicle cleaned. Thea drove it, back down the driveway and parked it in the garage after which Cal left for work. Thea called one of Michelle's friends and asked her if she knew Michelle's whereabouts, after which the friend called Michelle's divorce lawyer, whom she was scheduled to meet with later in the day. After learning that she had left lefties at the end of her shift the night before, and her cell phone went unanswered. He called the state police and reported her missing the state police in Shioga County had much more limited resources available to them that morning than they normally would for a missing persons case, since the majority of troopers and investigators in the area had been bused down to New York City to provide additional security and manpower in the wake of the attacks. Among them were some experts, in forensics. Many of the department's dogs and aviation had also been diverted to Lower Manhattan. Two of the investigators who remained went to see Cal at his dealership at 940A.M. Cal told them Michelle had never failed to return home after her evening shifts at lefties. He accompanied them back to his property and gave them written permission to search it, then returned to work. If they needed to take the minivan, Cal added, they could, but he wanted it back afterwards so he could have the oil changed, something he said Michelle always neglected to do. He told the investigators that she may have been using cocaine with some of the people she had gotten to know in Waverly.